Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Natasha Williams. Welcome to this special edition of SWI. In tonight's broadcast, we look back at some of the year's most memorable stories so far, and we begin with the day Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris burned. It was a fire so intense that it lasted for two days, the 15th and 16th of April. The burning of Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris stunned those watching it from the City of Lights and the many millions more watching around the world. Now, the exact cause remains unclear, but the famed church was undergoing renovations and it's believed a spark could have been what set off the unyielding inferno. Perhaps the most famous church in the world went 12 rounds with a relentless fire, and when it was over, the quintessential cathedral was staggered and scorched, but standing. Notre Dame was undergoing renovations and suffered colossal damages, but as the fire was finally extinguished Tuesday morning, resolve seemed to replace some of the shock and despair that had left so many numb. Cardinal Vincent Nichols, Archbishop of Westminster in England, tweeted, this is a disaster that touches their very soul. Collectivement. French President Emmanuel Macron told his nation, it is up to us to convert this disaster into an opportunity to come together and become better than we are. It is up to us to find the thread of our national project. The body of the church, it doesn't appear that it was damaged too much. Michael Desmond, a professor of architecture at LSU and director of graduate studies in the College of Art and Design, has for years extensively researched the role of architecture in society. Notre Dame is almost 800 years old, um, is identified with Paris probably more than any other structure and has been for most of those years in history. Everybody that goes wants to visit the cathedral, maybe the Eiffel Tower, but the cathedral is much, much older. Um, and it anchors the place. For generations, Notre Dame has been a place of pilgrimage and prayer. And even as religion in France has declined for decades, it remained the beating heart of French Catholicism, open every day for mass. Said one Parisian, it's a symbol. I mean, every time I drive to work, I see the cathedral. It's part of the landscape. We wouldn't imagine Paris without Notre Dame. Louisiana is rooted in French culture, and South Louisiana, unlike other areas of the South, is a place where Catholics are the norm, and religion and culture are one. The proof is easy to find. Take a drive down Highway 1. As you pass through cities and towns, large and small, you will see one predominant theme. Large, imposing Catholic churches, cathedrals, even in the smallest places, like Labadeville, Population, 1800. There you will find St. Philomena, as much a part of the landscape as the dirt itself. I think it's a part of, of any tour down um, by Lafourche and down the Mississippi River um, to visit. It certainly used to be. So many of those churches were built before the levee system so that they would, you would see them. They would be the marker. And you see them, since they're tall, the spires are tall, you see them across the landscape. They become guideposts in in more than just the spiritual sense, in an actual physical sense. Consider this timeline. Notre Dame had been the center of Paris for more than 300 years before the explorer La Salle proclaimed the heart of modern-day America as Louisiana in honor of King Louis of France. That was in 1682. 
Desmond says, given the role of Parisians in the founding of Louisiana, it is certain that many of our ancestors attended mass at Notre Dame. And try on this comparison of two cities, New Orleans and Paris. Paris has Notre Dame and the Eiffel Tower, New Orleans, St. Louis Cathedral, and the Superdome, a pair of very different yet iconic structures that symbolize each city. The cathedral in Jackson Square was the first non-apocalyptic view of New Orleans the world saw in the days following Katrina. There was President George W. Bush speaking to Americans, and there was St. Louis Cathedral, proving that life in some ways did go on as before. Anything that we learn from this? Well, we learned something about the depth of our common bonds, certainly, um, and the fact that so many people have expressed so much feeling and were touched by this, Catholics and not, around the world, um, is, is very moving, of course. You know, we, we share so much. I mean, in, in human societies, uh, we, we construct so much of the world we live in, and, and, and then we rely on it as though it's, it's the given part of the world, mm -hmm. you know, as though that's, that's reality, and it becomes our reality. And to have it challenged like this, or you remember where you were when the World Trade Towers were hit. Everybody seems to remember the same kind of thing. You don't expect the fabric of reality to be destroyed, to collapse. And when it does, it's, it's, it's something about this terrifying. Meantime, there is a new threat that worries the chief architect of France's historic monuments. The heat wave sweeping Europe, and if another follows, he says, could cause the vaulted ceilings of the cathedral to collapse. The historic and famed Louisiana Hayride performances were nominated for a Grammy this year, but they didn't win, and they may have lost their greatest cheerleader, Maggie Warwick, who died in late March. But a plan to revive the venue, credited with launching the music careers of Elvis, Hank Williams, and Johnny Cash, got a huge spark this year with a throwback concert and a show that took music lovers back to yesteryear. The stage is set, musicians, singers, and producers rehearsing for the big show. A large crowd gathering even before the doors open, like a flashback from the 1950s. I get to see a part of the history. I want to see a part of the history. It's important to me because I live here. Joan Lurie and her husband Aubrey moved to Shreveport 31 years ago from Africa. They are big Elvis fans and are excited to learn more about how he and other country stars got their start in Shreveport. The Louisiana Hayride. Longtime Bossier City Mayor Lorenz Walker was in the audience for some of those concerts broadcast live on KWKH radio and later on television from 1948 to 1960. I saw him actually happen. The Shreveport native remembers one performance in particular. I actually came and saw Hank Williams Sr. sing here when I was a child and the audience loved his music so much. They called him back about seven or eight times. Love sick blues is what he's saying. Mayor Walker saw other unknown singers at the time who went on to become megastars. I've watched Johnny Cage, Elvis Presley, all the big stars come through here one time or another and play. Mayor Walker, newly elected Shreveport Mayor Adrian Perkins, and even the governor of Louisiana came to celebrate the Grammy nomination of the Louisiana Hayride Tonight, a collection of 20 CDs of more than 500 songs chronicling a generation of stars who went on to make country and rock history at the Shreveport Municipal Auditorium. The Louisiana Hayride! A 224-page book, also part of the Bear Family's project, filled with rarely seen photos. The auditorium now on the Registry of Historic Places and home to life-size statues of Elvis Presley and James Burton. He said, I love you till I die. One of the first to take the mic, the governor of Louisiana, John Bell Edwards, a huge country music fan, crooning a George Jones favorite. To 
be here uh, with all these performers, the folks from the Shreveport area who, who are excited about this. I, I think it's special. Uh, and by the way, it's not just for the history. It's, it's so that we can teach our kids uh, what happened here in Shreveport and then keep this music alive. And Shreveport's mayor agrees. The world as we know it might not even know them, uh, the Elvis Presley's and Hank Williams, had it not been for the hayride and the platform that it gave them. It was here on this very stage where greats like Hank Williams, Elvis Presley, and Johnny Cash made musical history as a part of the Louisiana Hayride live radio show. It was the Bayou State's version of the Grand Old Opry. It was just as big as the Grand Ole Opry, and as you can see, communities like Nashville have fully taken advantage of that and become a mecca of music, so Shreveport's hoping to do the same thing. At the center of the push to regenerate interest in the Louisiana Hayride, Maggie and Alton Warwick. Maggie, a singer who performed here, and her husband own the name and performances and have worked for decades to revive the concerts and performances like the ones that were held here in years gone by for screaming crowds in the thousands. To get this nomination uh, was such a wonderful happening because that's like, you know, one of the premier organizations of the music industry. We said, well, we can't let this go by without people knowing about it in yes. Louisiana. And the celebration was on. Well, certain parts of it have been extremely emotional for me. Jerry K. Green, who grew up in Louisville, Texas, performed on the Louisiana Hayride. He fought back tears as he talked about coming back to Shreveport. This is the first time I've been on this stage since 1953. My last show on it was June 6 of 53, and I went into the Army on July 8th, drafted. The 86-year-old Korean War veteran didn't give up his dream of singing and went on to play on the Grand Ole Opry in 1967. But he says he'll never forget how he ended up on stage in Shreveport. It started with a long bus ride from Texas and knocking on the door of the radio station one Saturday morning. I hear some footsteps and the door opens a crack and I wonder what I wonder what I could do for me. And I said, I want to sing on Louisiana Hayride tonight. Oh. <laughs> He auditioned for Horace Logan, the show's producer, on the spot, singing a song he had written about a Louisiana girl who had broken his heart. The gist of it was, when you, for that, about that girl, when you board that train to old Louisiana, will you take my heart along, you know? <laughs> and I sang it on Louisiana Hay Ride that night. That was my first time on Louisiana Ray. I was 18 years old. It was right before my senior year of high school. He would make several more trips to Shreveport to sing and cut an album or two in Nashville. All fond memories now, memories that led him to pick up his guitar again eight years ago and start playing gigs again. If you think you've got troubles you can't overcome, don't sit like a bump on a log. You can do twice as much if you try half as hard as my part of the three-legged dog. Twenty-two-year-old Kate Rogers is a part of a new generation of artists dreaming of playing on stages like this one all over the country. A lot of the people who influenced me getting into this this music career stood right on that stage and they, and they played on the hayride. When they asked me to be a part of it, I thought I cannot believe I'm gonna be standing in the same spot as, as Johnny Cash. And Rogers, who hopes to release his first album this year, is living his dream, fueled by the stars that got their start in Shreveport. I wanna give everything away here, but uh, I, I'm just uh, bringing a modern feel to the country classics. And for Maggie Warwick, that's music to her ears, those who could someday continue her decades-old dream. You're exactly right, Natasha. It's like a birthday gift. It's like God has opened up the skies, you know, and brought all these wonderful people together and this event uh, and of being nominated for a Grammy, it's like a, a miracle.
The death of Maggie Warwick with her husband, who owns the rights to the Louisiana Hayride, may have been a big blow to the push for a comeback. But we spoke with others connected to the project, and they told us to expect a major announcement about that project in the next few months. In May, the old state capitol celebrated the 25th anniversary of its major renovation. Now, why was the celebration such a big deal? Well, it's because, as many may not remember, by the early 1990s, the old state house stood close to the brink before some quick maneuvering ensured its preservation. Tell me about where we are right now, this space. This is one of the most magnificent spaces in the building, I think, and in one of the most historic spaces. This was the house chamber. There's so much history here. This is the, the room uh, where the original Louisiana lottery uh, was passed in 1898, I believe. It is the lottery, by the way, historically, that led to a ban on lotteries throughout the country for many years, but it took place here. Uh, this is the room where uh, Louisiana seceded from the Union during the Civil War. The secessionist convention was, was, took place right here. There are old paintings of that. But even with all that history, the old state capitol stood on the brink of ruin by the late 1980s. It wasn't even opened, and its doors were unlocked for the rarest of occasions. Today, the majestic capital is on a 25-year run of unparalleled success, so it's easy to understand why this celebration of a renovation is such a big deal. This building that we see in all its beauty today literally was falling down. Bob Courtney was Assistant Secretary of State under the late Fox McKithen. By 1990, he was very concerned about the bleak future of this castle on the hill. The building was closed to the public. The roof leaked everywhere. Water was coming in through the walls because it, the out exterior surface is actually brick covered with plaster. And this brick was porous, so there was no humidity control. There was no air conditioning inside. Uh, and so it was literally rotting from the ground up and, and just kind of falling apart from the, the ceiling down. So he suggested that the capital be transferred to the Secretary of State's office and its care. At the time, the state museum system had control of it, but their attention was elsewhere. Two major events kept any revival project on the far back burner. One, there was a budget crisis. And two, when fire swept through the Cabildo in New Orleans, the sole focus of museum insiders was on it. The Cabildo was and is the piece de resistance. It had long been home of the Louisiana State Museum. The old state capital was more like a third cousin twice removed. And nothing was being done here. And so there was an attempt, there was talk of transferring this building to the city of Baton Rouge. And uh, I just thought uh, a, a state capital building is a treasure that belongs to the state, not to one city. It took a lot of politicking and a lot of convincing, but Courtney and his group stood their ground. And he says they had a lot of help. We had two valiant local legislators who fought with us in the House and Senate. Uh, Raymond Jetson in the House sponsored the bill and Larry Bankston in the Senate. We got it passed, Buddy Romer signed it, and then we had to figure out what to do with this place. A $6 million check from the state went to restore the building itself, the brick and mortar. And money raised privately ensured that the exhibits would be ones that would keep people coming back. The exhibits remain vibrant, and the spectacular stained glass dome remains the number one photo op for one of the top tourist attractions in the state. And the reason we're celebrating it, Andre, is because it's, it was a monumental feat. I, people just really don't realize. Mary DeRusso oversees the operations of the old state capitol, as well as other properties. She says the timing of things just worked out to revive the place when it was at its lowest point. Nobody was really taking a keen interest in it, which is why um, Bob Courtney and Fox McKithen uh, wanted to take this building over and make it part of the Secretary of State's office, which we think is entirely appropriate. 
Uh, we're so dedicated to Louisiana politics and history and we spend all day every day talking to those hundreds of school kids that you see and the adults who come about the importance of democracy and voting and being an active and engaged citizen. We had a vision. I think what makes me happy is that vision turned out to be correct. It's important to remember our history and it's important to preserve our history and to protect things like this. Now coming up October 24th is the Capitol's Spirits of Louisiana Gala. It plays off on the spirits that may roam the hallways of the old structure and the spirits being distilled in Louisiana. The event raises money for the old state Capitol's wonderful exhibits that visitors always enjoy. Now to the St. Landry Parish town of Melville. Water problems have plagued the town for decades and in recent years reached a breaking point. Businesses, schools, and much of the things around town have closed shop and moved on. But what now? Will Melville get a multi-million dollar water system it desperately needs? We went to Melville and talked to the mayor and residents who are looking to bring life back to the place once known as the catfish capital of Louisiana. Velma Durasol Hendricks was born and raised in Melville. We definitely don't have the money to get the things that are necessary for good living. Hendricks was elected mayor in November. The 80-year-old retired school teacher says she felt a sense of obligation. I am accustomed to Melville having certain things and we no longer have them. And I just want to see Melville come back to where it once was. The town no longer has a bank. It closed a few months ago. The gas station also closed up shop, as well as a number of corner stores. We had public schools here. We no longer have a public school. We had a pharmacy. We no longer have the pharmacy. The small town nestled in the northern part of St. Landry Parish along the Atchafalaya River is struggling. Now we do have uh, a health service. This is um, Med Express. I think if we could get some industry here, we could bring the citizens back. A recent census says the town population has dropped to 1,041, and adding to the list of problems Melville faces, a recent report has placed the town on the governor's list of 10 worst drinking water systems in the state. Like many small communities, Melville can't afford to maintain or make improvements to their 60-year-old drinking water system. We only have one small well that's operating, and we need the large well and use the small well as our backup. In the past, well, Melville was known for having one of the best water systems or the best water that you could possibly consume. But over time, with the types of pipes that was placed in the ground, these galvanized pipes, they began to deteriorate. Willie Haynes III served three terms as mayor of Melville and says getting the new water system up and running is important for another reason, too. With a new system, uh, it will be more upgraded, whereas you could keep uh, a count of household that's using the water. Because that's a problem now, because some people don't pay for water. No. Uh, there have been situations where uh, customers was terminated because of lack of payment, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the front portion of the house was cut off. Mm -hmm. but the back still water was being uh, used. Haynes says even if and when the town's old water system is replaced, a lot more needs to be done. We're going to just have to get involved more with our area legislators, our senators, our representatives. They must look at us here in this area. We vote for them. We need them as much as they need us. Yeah, we're excited about getting the grant um, so that we're assured of um, uh, quality water. Grant Canatelli agrees. His family owns Melville's only grocery store. So they're getting this grant, $4.3 million, um, and a loan along with it. It's essential for the town to grow, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, because um, I mean, basically if you lose your water, you, you, um, we don't have much left now, but um, you know, we definitely don't want to lose water and the quality and reliability of our water. Canatelli says his business has suffered in recent years and is hoping improvements in the water system and in other areas will turn their town around. 
We're trying everything we can to keep the doors open and um, it's really a struggle um, um, being in a small community uh, with just not a lot of resources. Uh, our citizens just don't have a lot of extra income to spend. Michael Clark says the new water meters that come with the new water system could be the start of an economic boost the town needs. You're paying a flat rate now, but water meter is going to say if you don't use so much water, then your bill is going to be cheap, you know what I'm saying? And it's going to help because people don't want to fix their leaks here in town. If you have water meters, then they're going to get their leaks fixed because they don't want the water meter to continue running. But Clark, who served on the town council for two years, recently resigned and believes fixing the water system is only part of the solution. He says town officials have to spend the money that's coming in wisely. Bills not being, you know, taken care of, you know, and, you know, just it wasn't good, you know. When I sit on the board, we never really had statements in front of us. So, I mean, it's kind of hard to do anything when you never have statements in front of you, bank statements, anything like that. So, I mean, and that's one of the reasons why I left, because I couldn't make a decision if I didn't have nothing in front of me to make a decision with. New Mayor Velma Hendrick is planning lots of changes, starting with laying out the good, bad, and even the ugly on council tables for all the residents to see. She wants to turn her hometown around and keep it going in the right direction. You come into this job, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars in the hole. Yes. So I plan to make some type of arrangement with the companies mm -hmm. that we can pay, you know, so much per month mm -hmm. and get those bills paid off. Help me see what Melville will look like in five years. Melville will be clean the personal properties, the ditches. There will be a service station. There will be a pharmacist. Uh, there will be corner groceries. And just a beautiful place. Melville officials say their water project is moving along. An engineer and project manager are in place, and they should begin replacing that old water system in about a month. That'll be a long time coming. Mm -hmm. All the best to them. 60 years. That is our show for this week, everyone. Remember, you can watch us and anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our brand new app. Download it for free from your app store. It's an upgraded version, and it features news, public affairs, documentaries, and how-tos, and many other programs. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For all of us here at Louisiana Public Public Broadcasting. I'm Andre Morrow. I'm Natasha Williams. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.